Hindu women's rituals in rural Rajasthan. So I conducted um, field work, living there for about nine, ten months, and then went back um, many times. And I observed many of the women that I was living with performing a particular ritual to Sita. Now, Sita, again, some of you will be familiar with the Rama and Sita story. Um, Rama and Sita are characters in the great epic, the Ramayana, great epic that presents them as role models. So Rama and Sita, they're the ideal man and woman, and really that's how they're presented. Uh, and you can imagine that lots of narratives around Sita present her as being obedient, submissive, um, and Rama as being strong and powerful, so the ultimate picture of masculine um, authority. And Ramayana is a really popular tale in, in India, for example, and is told in many different ways. And these role models are really a strong part um, of most of the narratives. So I found it curious because the women who I saw, who I observed um, conduct this ritual, I knew were also suffering from intimate partner violence. And, you know, my gender world, I'm thinking, well, at the root of that is the fact that we've got power inequality, gender inequality, and now you're worshipping Sita. Well, that's not very helpful. That's how I saw it for a while. And just to go on, it gets worse, the story of Rama and Sita in certain depictions. So she gets some of you, just in case any of you, passed, this story's passed you by. Um, Sita gets kidnapped by Ravana, a very evil demon, and taken off to his... Um, Ireland. She then has to be, I do apologise for the oversimplification for anybody here who's got any, and I know that, I know Naheem's laughing. Sorry. <laughs> um, but Hanuman, so she has to be rescued, so she's rescued by Hanuman the monkey god and his army of uh, monkeys and taken back to Rama. Rama chooses not to believe that she was actually um, kidnapped. Instead, uh, Rama said, no, I think you had an affair with Ravana, so you better prove to me um, that you didn't cheat on me. And so Sita is made to go through a fire test, obviously a very violent um, act. So again, that's confusing. Why on earth? Why on earth are these Vajrasani women? You know, I've read, I've read Angle, just the herring words, they're not passive. Why are they, um, why are they conducting this ritual that they put together themselves? So reflecting on it, again, um, Sanskrit scholars who have looked into this particular epic from a gender perspective, there's different schools of thought. There are some that would argue, really bad role model, you know, we've got to stop um, this story being told, particularly to children and so on. <coughs> there's another school of thought that argues, actually, if you unravel it, what options does Sita have? Actually, what options to resist or challenge does Sita have in that particular um, context? Perhaps she withstood the fire test as knowing that she was innocent to actually highlight how ridiculous and awful her husband was. So by actually going through it, submitting to it, perhaps that in a way is a form of challenging. Challenge. It is about exerting agency to highlight um, abuse. Now, that's slightly uncomfortable, but if you really think about it, if you don't have very many resources or any resources to hand that you can use to, to challenge your situation, then maybe in that particular situation, submissiveness can be seen um, as an act of resilience and, and defiance. So taking that thinking about it and reflecting back on the, on the ritual um, that these uh, women were, were conducting, made me think actually they're not seeing Sita as passive or submissive. They're actually seeing her as, as courageous and seeing her as somebody that they can relate to. So actually really important um, role model that's motivating them and spurring them in their, in their lives. And just through the process of coming together and putting that ritual together and sharing and um, performing it um, together, again strengthens bonds but it also, around the edges, offers an opportunity to share what you are going through and to think through and reflect on the strategies that you might um, take. And two women in particular who I spoke to came through with two different um, responses to their situation. 
One prem just left her husband and said, that's it, I'm never going back. I've had enough. Um, so she made her own when she was work she was helped by um, by an NGO. Uh, another another lady Debbie said, Well, I'm going back. I'm going back to my husband. Yes, I know I left him because she because he beat me, but I'm going and I said, Why are you going back? She said, I'm going back because he knows I can leave. If he does it again, I'm leaving. I know how to, I know where to get support. So I'm going to I'm going to go back. So that for me was a real sort of moment of just understanding again the complexity of how agency and resilience plays itself out in different contexts. So the importance of understanding context, but understanding um, context at a very um, micro level. Now, taking India, India is a really interesting example, so then kind of going outwards. The statistics on violence in India, recent um, research by the International Centre for Research on Women found that the view violence is normal, women should expect to be beaten, about 52% of those that they surveyed, and it was a very large survey, hold that, um, hold that view, and that's boys and it's um, girls. And digging into that, India is a context in which obviously the economy has boomed, there's more and more opportunities for women in the workplace. The feminist movement in India has always been really strong, and it is a very strong um, force. There's a reasonable amount of legislation around to protect um, women's rights. So understanding why violence continues in that context is quite curious, but it makes a very important um, case study. And part of the reason, again, going back to this idea of how do we push for mindset change, social um, norm change, is really people don't, don't hold static views. So this is the other kind of disheartening part of the, um, the raw space, is that you might, you might achieve in one um, instance a change. You might convince a husband that he shouldn't beat his wife. Or you might convince a woman that actually the fact that your husband does that to you is not, is not okay. Um, but, then, but then you'll see in the next moment that view just, just changes. And we see that with, with particularly harmful cultural practices all the time. So with FGM, a family will say no, publicly no, we're going to abandon, we're not going to do this anymore. They might collect the t-shirt from the NGO and then they will go home and they will continue with it. And it's because... All of us are caught up um, with all of these different influences that are coming at us in different ways and in contexts that are changing um, really um, quickly. And we need to sort of understand that. So the sands are shifting and people contradict themselves all the time. I mean, if we're honest, we all contradict ourselves. Um, so trying to really find the entrance points, the entry points to push for change is difficult. But again, to come back to my point that I made earlier on, how do we do it? I have to leave or end with something of an answer. And it is coming back to local women's organisations. And it is the work that they are doing on the ground. It's the peer networks. It's the positive deviants, men and women, who just refuse to accept the status um, quo. And coming back to the argument around resourcing, we're seeing in this country... Uh, women refugees being cut, we are seeing funding for domestic violence being um, squeezed and that's despite the evidence that we've got just in the UK that it's a real um, problem. We're seeing in the UK there's many different cultural harmful practices, we've only just started to scratch the surface, so it's this issue of lack of, um, lack of resource. So in a sense there is an answer there that we could build on, um, we can build on the kind of social and cultural uh, capital in the, all of the examples that I've given you that exist that with some nurturing um, and support could then really change into quite um, important and transformative movements mm. for um, change. So I'm going to a couple of women's organisations again working in um, this is Myanmar. This the top one, the UNDP. I've got to bring it actually. The UNDP have a project that they've rolled out in a few um, countries where they give out whistles to women to just blow a whistle to try and draw attention if something happens to them or they feel unsafe. So 
to highlight female entrepreneurship in Myanmar, the women who received the whistles to a particular organisation in Yangon have blinged them up. They bling them up, they decorate them, and then they resell them to make money. So I'm not sure they're using them for the purpose intended, <laughs> but they're, they're taking the opportunity, um, and they're really quite attractive. I do have a few. Um, so, again, it's just understanding the resourcefulness and, and how, and thinking about how to capture that resourcefulness. So I'm going to end with this picture, where I might not appreciate things. <laughs> um, so I started my research being dressed up in um, Rajasthani outfits, um, and now I'm in bulletproof jackets. But this, I don't actually need this to do my research, just before any of you get overly concerned, but it's just part of our security protocol, is that it's necessary for me to do hostile environment training which was actually a lot of fun. <laughs> but if I had ever thought that I would be doing um, or wearing an outfit like that in the course of my research, I wouldn't have believed um, anyone. But yes, that's after being kidnapped for about an hour. But it obviously <laughs> didn't scar me too much. <laughs> so I'm going to end there. And nobody can ask any questions, which is lovely. <laughs>